Hi everyone, uh, thank you for your presence. I would like to also thank you for your trust um, with the bank. It's an important period for us, of course, to define and to um, know how we can tackle 2022 after two exceptional years. We have four billion of people on the lockdown, uh, real activism on the central banks, and of course we have seen the uh, impressive reactions on the financial markets. Objective today is to give you a maximum of content uh, with explicit scenarios and explanation, what we think about the market, how we can tackle 2022. Our first idea a few weeks ago was to communicate around the exiting of uh, the COVID years, but we have to, to review our positioning because of the last news we received from the COVID and the pandemic. And of course, it will be uh, an additional layer of risk we will have to manage in 22 after these two exceptional years, as I mentioned. Uh, finally, 2020 was quite easy to manage. Um, on the investment strategy, investment outlook, we decided at the end of 2019 to have some shock absorbers in the portfolios. And of course, what's happened in March, um, this capacity to absorb was very helpful and to be able to um, to deliver this capacity to, to protect your assets. And of course, we switch progressively into more active uh, portfolio management and to try to deliver performances. 2021 was also an exceptional year with a recovery scenario. The most important thing was in Jan, uh, of course, to define exactly do we think that the vaccination could provide the right uh, effect for the population, for the case, and overall fundamentals were positive with some visibility, no bad news, and just some rotation in the market we have to manage. Two main difficulties in 2021, China and duration. And uh, at this stage, we have managed, well managed that, uh, that situation. For 2022, I'll leave the floor to Norman with the team. And of course, happy to share, uh, to have discussion around some questions at the end of the presentation. Norman, I'll leave you the floor. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mikhail, and uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. For those of you who I haven't met, my name is Norman Villeman. I'm the CIO for Wealth Management here at UBP. And joining Mikhail and I today is going to be a panel of UBP experts to expand on the key themes that we expect to drive returns as well as risks in 2022. As Mikhail pointed out, more importantly, take your questions and have an interactive dialogue about what lies ahead. Um, when we look at things, really laying the economic foundation uh, uh, as the global economy begins an important pivot uh, really is going to be uh, the important message for today. And to help us do that, we have UBP's uh, Patrice Gautry. He's our chief economist. And joining Patrice is Peter Kinsella, UBP's global uh, foreign exchange strategist, who's going to take us through the prospect of a meaningful increase in FX vol in the year ahead. Um, in terms of the agenda today, I'm going to provide a brief overview of some of the key macro and asset class views that uh, form the foundation for our 22, uh, 2022 investment outlook uh, before pivoting to the roundtable discussion with my colleagues and unpack some of these themes in more detail. For those of you who have joined our webinars before, again, you want to feel free to submit your questions at any time as they come to you. And I'll try and incorporate them into the discussions that we have with my colleagues. But to kick things off, we prepared a video to highlight UBP's key convictions for the coming year, which we're going to explore in more detail uh, later today. <laughs> 
again, I just want to remind everybody, we've already started receiving some questions. Uh, so feel free, uh, if you have a question, anytime it comes to your mind, uh, please submit them uh, using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So just kicking off to lay the foundation for our discussion today, as we've seen in the video, um, what's really going to lay the foundation for what lies ahead for 2022 and always for our investment decision making is the macroeconomic backdrop. Um, and for 2022, it presents not only a cyclical change, but more importantly, uh, the potential for some structural changes in the major economies in the world. One of the topics we will definitely cover today, and we've already got questions on, is this question of inflation. And a lot of people are thinking this is a period that looks like the 1970s, the great inflation period uh, in economic history. But one of the things that we're looking at is the prospect that maybe that's not the right uh, lens to be looking through. Maybe the post-war period, which also had elevated inflation, but also had elevated growth. This is something we'll explore in a little bit more detail. On the other side of the world in China, China is dealing with very different types of problems. Uh, they're seeing a secular slowdown in growth start to take place, some concern on that front. And consumer price inflation, as you can see, is actually quite low as producer prices are squeezing corporate profits in different parts of China. And so that's another change that we're going to have to focus on. These structural combined with cyclical changes means that on the next slide, for equity investors in particular, we're going to have to keep be very aware of the risks that lie ahead. Fortunately, because we think the growth story remains constructive in 2022, investors can expect about 8 to 10 percent returns in the coming year. It's about half of what we've seen both this year and in 2020. But more importantly for investors, you should be aware that as we move into this new phase of the economy, the prospect that drawdowns come more frequently and are deeper uh, is likely going forward. So this issue of risk management is going to be very key as we navigate equities in 2022. On the following slide, this risk management story really plays through in bonds as well. We've already seen the start of this normalization of interest rates in 2021. We think that continues in 2022, but potentially matched with rising spreads. And so for bond investors, what that means is another challenging year, just like they saw in 2021, uh, where you essentially get, we call it coupon minus types of returns. As you get your coupon, but rising interest rates and widening spreads tend to hinder mark-to-market -market returns. All of these structural shifts on the following slide are leading to a number of transformations within the global economy. And on our 2022 outlook, we highlight four transformations that investors should embrace. One of them is very well talked about today, the challenges of global climate transition. Um, however, even here, we think uh, the opportunity is much more nuanced than investors think. This is an area where stories about solar and wind are going to be very important. However, this only accounts for a very small part of overall energy production today. And so the transformation of old economy uh, energy production, old economy heating is going to be a key investment opportunities as well in 2022. The shift to common prosperity in China was very destabilizing, as Mikhail pointed out in the market. However, as we move into next year, that's going to continue to create some risks, but in increasingly some very targeted opportunities for investors in the year ahead. One transformation that is going underrepresented in conversations with our clients this year is what's happening here at home in the European Union. Uh, the European Union has long been constrained by its inability to mobilize fiscal stimulus. We think 2022 is going to be a year where that foundation starts to shift. And Patrice Gautry is going to unpack that and what that means going forward uh, for opportunities in Europe. And then lastly, a lot of investors have been talking about technology. And indeed, since this pandemic, technology has been a mainstay of portfolios. One thing that we're starting to see is that within global industrials, 
their leveraging of technology is creating an opportunity uh, for us to generate meaningful, sustainable growth prospects, even in this cyclical industry uh, of the past. So with those four transitions, uh, as well as the structural changes, why don't I bring my panelists uh, into, uh, into the mix? And again, if you have some questions, feel free to submit them and we'll begin to work them into uh, the overall discussion. Um, so maybe why don't I begin again where it always begins, which is the global economy. And I'll bring Patrice in. A big part of the questions we're getting already today are about inflation, stagflation, um, how does that play out? Is stagflation really the outcome that we should be looking for in 2022? No, stagflation is not our central scenario. And good morning, everyone. And uh, that is to say the, the message for next year is constructive and remains positive. Uh, so stagflation is not uh, the key word uh, to characterize, in fact, the growth we are expecting for next year. And uh, I, I would prefer... To, to name or to mention this is a still sustained growth. Of course, if we compare with last year that or this year, 2021, uh, we should have a bit of a slowdown from 4.6% in average this year to 4% next year. But 4% remains a very distant and constructive trend because it remains above the potential growth, above the average growth, and, and still significant and still distant growth trend. From, notably which is important for the uh, EPS growth and the profits at, at the company le at company level. So uh, we do expect still sustained growth and uh, for different reasons, I would say, because of course, consumers remain in the driving seat. And all in all, I would say that the economic policy, that to say the monetary policy and the budgetary policy remain still supportive for the growth, uh, growth outlook. Regarding inflation, of course, we have to live with this high inflation level. That is to say, the bad news is inflation should continue to rise at the end of this year. So the Q4 number would be awful. That is to say, to continue to increase further. But we should remain at this high level in the Q1 at the beginning of next year and to be patient and to wait for the middle of the next year to see significant decrease. So that is to say, all in all, we should have, I would say, a strong high inflation to continue in 2022 and in the second part of next year to see, uh, I would say, some progressive declining process in the inflation. So to go back in 2023 in the 2, 2.5% range, which is a more normal situation and more in line with the traditional central bank's target. So, so the story for 2022 is not so much one of stagflation in the 1970s. It's one of good growth, elevated inflation, which looks a bit more like the 1950s in that sense. Is that right, Patrice? Yes, exactly. Uh, and the key drivers, uh, if I may, it was not only the consumer side, but I would say the renewal and the rebound in terms of investment. We have in the introduction, we have mentioned the climate change, the new industrial setup uh, for traditional industries. So uh, I would say on the positive side, uh, it will, it should generate a higher productivity gains, higher productivity gains, and probably to, um, to be able to increase the potential growth, because in, notably in Western countries, but also in China, what we are facing now is still a, a decline in the productivity gains and an aging population uh, that unfortunately decrease the potential growth. So the renewed investment coming from the public sector and the private sector with a still comfortable level of consumption or decent trend in terms of, con uh, of consumption, thanks to uh, a still healthy labor environment, should um, enhance, in fact, the growth numbers and should be able to raise the productivity and the potential growth, not only for next year, but probably for the next two or three years. So that is said, uh, this is the challenge. Or if we go back to a mediocre uh, environment growth, as Mrs. Lagarde at the IMF described the year 2015, or we are able, in fact, to generate a higher level of potential growth and productivity gain that should continue to sustain the growth. Of course, I'm still in the positive camp, probably too positive or too naive, but uh, I'm still waiting because 
all the funds we have seen coming from public investment and also private investment because this is a large deal and we have seen a lot of involvement coming from the private sector at COP26. So this is a, a great and a large amount of money that we put in the economy. So this should, in theory, and the paper, uh, generate productivity gains. And we'll, we'll, we'll uh, spend some time on the investments that's flowing into the economy and how we capitalize that, on that. But let's stay with the inflation story. And so the story is one of elevated inflation for 2022. And we have a couple of questions here. Okay, if inflation is going to be elevated still in 2022, how do we protect uh, portfolios? And I'll walk through, I mean, some of the things that we've been doing in portfolios uh, really is multifold. And so I think you're going to need to take a diversified approach uh, to addressing this inflation question at its core. One of the things a lot of investors have looked to and we've looked to as well is inflation linked bonds that has worked very well uh, through the year to provide that cushion. But then as well, one of the challenges and we'll spend a little time on this is inflation is eroding the real return in fixed income. And so uh, you're going to have to pivot towards uh, more alternative strategies in fixed income, things like long short credit, hedge funds, or really illiquid private market types of strategies uh, to try and restore positive inflation adjusted returns on that front. The one thing, and I think surprises a lot of people when, they, uh, when you think about uh, an elevated inflation period, in the 1970s, everyone says equities, you didn't make money in equities. And indeed the S&P 500 for a number of years really treaded water. But when you look at total returns with dividends, et cetera, even in the 1970s, the S&P 500 delivered a modest uh, positive return above inflation. And so one of the anchors that will be very key uh, on that front is going to be the equity space and investing in equities. And so that's the approach we are taking to protecting portfolios. And when I say protecting, trying to deliver real rates of return going forward. Um, maybe I'll bring Peter into this discussion a little bit. We are seeing, obviously, inflation pick up in the United States. Many other parts of the world don't have such a big inflation problem, or at least a sustained inflation problem. And so you're starting to see policy divergence uh, translating into a bit more volatility in FX markets. Um, how is this playing out in terms of our overall FX exposure? Sure. Good morning. Uh, thanks, Norman. Um, I think really when, when we address the question of FX volatility in a, in, a, in a wide scale, what we can look at, because FX volatility is not forecastable, we can only look at uh, previous episodes of, of higher and increasing volatility regimes. And normally speaking, they, they're reflective of kind of three, uh, three separate themes. So the first, obviously, is when we get monetary policy divergence between central banks. And uh, that's certainly uh, increasingly evident, particularly between the, uh, the Fed and the ECB. The second is when we see very big positioning unwinds, where we have excessively long or excessively short positioning. Um, and the third, of course, is when we get very large current account imbalances, uh, which again uh, unwind through very large FX depreciations. So I think in, in the current situation, at least two of the three, um, uh, two of the three uh, criteria have been met. So it is rather likely that we will see, um, in our view at least, a higher volatility regime. What that means in, in the effects space is that the dollar is likely to be, uh, to be, you know, to enjoy a pretty constructive year. And that reflects, one, the incre increasing interest rate profile in, in the U.S., two, um, the improvement in the U.S. twin deficit, and three, um, very, very large portfolio investments towards uh, the United States. So this is all pretty constructive for the dollar, and we do anticipate that the dollar will continue to, uh, to appreciate you know, across the board and indeed against both uh, the major and the um, emerging market currencies in the, over the course of 2022. Um, for carry trades, uh, and particularly for emerging market currencies, um, they're going to, have a, going to largely face a pretty difficult year. On the one hand, uh, dollar appreciation, of course, is, is bad news for, uh, for emerging market currencies, as we all know. But that, this is also, uh, I would say, um, confounded by the fact uh, or compounded by the fact that we are seeing slower growth dynamics from China. So this will result most likely in a difficult outlook for emerging market currencies, many of which have already weakened uh, in recent weeks. And we do anticipate that this will continue to be the case. 
Um, elsewhere, we, we do anticipate that the, the Swiss franc will, will retain its uh, very you know, broad and modest depreciation profile, uh, which is consistent, of course, with the uh, very large capital inflows, which we have seen and are likely to continue to see. And uh, the euro, of course, we think is likely to, uh, to deteriorate and to, dep to depreciate over the course of the year, reflecting one, a uh, very large uh, uh, portfolio of divestments from the eurozone, two, this increasing monetary policy divergence, and three, the, the large slowdown in China, which of course will lead to a reduction in the eurozone's trade surplus. So I would say to sum up the FX market, it's one of, I would say, higher volatility, broad dollar appreciation, and uh, the underperformance of currencies which have a traditionally high beta to global growth. And, and Peter, if we can, if we can uh, focus in on the euro a bit, we've got a question coming in. The euro has already seen a fairly dramatic fall in the last few weeks. Um, what accounts for that fall? How much more do you see uh, uh, in the months ahead on euro dollar? Okay, um, what accounts for the fall is one, obviously the, um, the increasing rate differential between the US and, and the Eurozone. Certainly if we look at you know, simple two year yield differentials, that explains a lot of the decline. If we do assume that uh, US yields continue to steepen at the front end of the curve, um, that should translate into further downside in, in Euro dollar, um, easily to what levels of around 110, uh, possibly even by, uh, by Christmas or, or just thereafter. Um, the second reason um, that we've seen the euro weaken is that we have seen this very um, large increase in portfolio divestments of so people taking their investments from the eurozone and selling them. And this has been a, a very significant marginal driver of, um, of euro depreciation. The third, and I would say a pretty important driver of the recent euro weakness, is the reduction in the eurozone trade surplus from levels of just under 300 billion uh, euros to current levels in and around 250. And that's literally in the space of the last four months. So it's this uh, triumvirate of uh, you know, factors which are, are indeed sort of uh, leading to a weaker euro. And we think that this will continue over the course of 2022. Maybe if we pivot back to Patrice um, and go back to one of the points you highlighted, which is uh, the investment story that's required. Um, one of the changes that we've been looking at that I think very much goes underreported at this point uh, is the prospect of change in fiscal policy constraints in the European Union. How is this evolving and, and what does this mean in terms of flexibility to do the kinds of investments you've talked about? Yes, we do expect with the changes we are, uh, are going to see, uh, notably coming from the new German government and the new coalition in place now is a significant change in the fiscal rules because you know at this point of time the Maastricht Treaty is no longer under rules. That is to say, we have postponed the rules related to fiscal deficit to be limited to 3% and public debt to be limited to 60% of GDP. We are closer to 100% of GDP. So, and it was in fact supposed that these Maastricht Treaty rules to come back in 2023. But we have seen a couple of changes. That is to say, of course, with the recovery fund that has been launched at the EU level during the pandemic, we have seen, I would say, some changes and important structural changes because, of course, this is uh, a part of grants, a part of transfers uh, to different countries. And it was not the case in the previous crisis or in the previous years. So this is just the beginning, probably, of a new potential process of how the EU is managed in the future years. And we have seen, notably, I do insist of the German coalition because it's supposed to come at power in the next weeks uh, with Mr. Uh, Scholz as the new chancellor. But we have seen other platform and the electoral platform, they want to change a bit and to relax, in fact, this Maastricht Treaty, not to abandon the Maastricht Treaty, but for instance, just specifically, not to count the public investment and notably public investment related to climate change or to changes in transition period for industries, um, not to include these investment or specific investment into the Maastricht Treaty. That is to say, it would be made outside the Maastricht Treaty constraints. That is to say, this is an open window, in fact, for the governments to increase significantly their public investment and to um, accelerate, in fact, the transition to a new era. As, as mentioned at the beginning, this should create productivity gains and higher potential growth. But more importantly, 
we should live with, I would say, more flexible rules regarding uh, inv public investment, regarding also fiscal investment, fiscal situation, and also public debt. So this is a, an important change that, of course, will have positive impact in terms of growth, in terms of corporate activity, but also um, in terms of pricing for the bond market. And I think one of the points that you raised, Patrice, is uh, is a very important one. I think going really under discussed in this uh, climate change discussion, and that's this willingness to invest in transition. Uh, I think to a large extent, a lot of people are focusing on a lot of new green investment, which definitely is needed, solar, wind, what have you. Um, but when you look at the figures, the need for transition, for example, and the Germans have highlighted this, the transition investment required to change heating systems to be climate friendly um, is enormous. Um, and I think this is one of the messages, uh, just quantifying the investments that you're talking about, Patrice. Um, the numbers that uh, I've seen, they range anywhere from 50 to $100 trillion through uh, 2050. And for everybody on the line, obviously a very large number, to frame that, the emergence of China from 1979 to today, most people will put a number of around 25 trillion, um, moving China from uh, basically a closed economy to the second largest economy of the world. And so the kind of investment we're talking about for climate is double or even four times the type of investment we saw in China uh, giving us, uh, I think we think a fairly good outlook. But I think one of the other things important, it also requires us to diversify our approach to investing in this transition. Again, things, green technologies, wind, solar, hydrogen, et cetera, very important. But we're looking at the energy transition where you take older companies, moving them into more greener states ha as they make that investment, that's gonna be a very important. And then more tactically, areas in the impact investing space uh, that are targeting opportunities uh, that uh, help uh, uh, transition the economy. And so there's gonna be a multi-pronged approach uh, to that investment, transition and new green. Um, we've talked about this for Europe, Patrice, I'll bring you back in, but we're seeing a similar type of story in China here in terms of what they're intending to do the economy is much slower than other parts of the world. They want to reflate, um, but they're hesitant because of property. Green Does green give them a new opportunity to uh, restore growth in China? Yes, certainly, because as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, China, unfortunately, is facing different different headwinds. We have, um, as we saw during the year, these uh, COVID problems, and with the COVID zero policy, it obliged, in fact, to enter in new local lockdowns and several times during the year. And we have this common prosperity that changed the rules, uh, the medium term and the long term rules of how the growth in China will evolve. That is to say, we are no longer baiting on an 8 to 10 percent GDP growth, but now it's more close to 5 percent. So 5 percent seems to be 5 or 4 percent. Um, 5 percent seems to be low, but in fact, it comes with structural changes, as you mentioned. Now, consumption should be the major part of the growth number. This is the first part of this common prosperity. But uh, the other part is that structural change coming into industry. Innovation is very important uh, topics. And of course, in order to have an independent technology, if we compare or if we refer to the US competitions, but also to enter in new, in new business and to develop, um, I would say, more friendly and more important investment, investment into the climate change and transition into new energy. We have seen recently uh, the steel use of coal, uh, of coal to, um, to, um, to answer to the demand during the winter seasons, but we have see also seen some political involvement into the COP26 in China for the medium term in order to reduce the consumptions of traditional fossils, uh, energy environment. So that is to say, this is big changes uh, for China that could generate once again productivity gains, higher potential growth. That is to say, this is not and less and less dependent on the export story or the external story, but more to create an autonomous situation in, in 
terms of domestic demand and to for the supply side, that's to say not only for the energy, the traditional manufacturing sector and the new service sector that continue to develop, to be able to answer to the huge demand and potential demand created by uh, the consumer uh, the consumer side. So yes, this is a big change. It has to be appreciated on the medium terms, that's to say not only for next year, uh, but also for the next three, five years uh, to come, because this is a major change of rules. I would say that if I look at it globally, US, Europe, China, um, Europe has already been involved in the process and probably it's a very serious uh, involvement in terms of the funds, in terms of the taxonomy. We, we have seen uh, probably next year or the years to come that um, the carbon tax to be involved and China is very serious for the amount they want to invest. At this point of time, US is a bit lagging in terms of discussions, in terms of involvement, in terms of, of budget and uh, public money to be invested. This is still in discussion in, in the Congress, uh, in the US Congress. But I guess that once they decide to enter in this field, they will be highly competitive with a high level of means to be invested in this area. So very important to, uh, to consider for not only next year, but the next three, five years. And I think just as we've talked about in Europe, we were where we want to be targeted um, on in terms of capitalizing on climate. So we have things like Italy, which is benefiting from the EU recovery fund. We have impact investing in Europe and transitional investing in Europe. We kind of want to do the same thing in China as well. And as you point out, shift away from this export mindset, really more domestic. So climate is one area, but the other area is really more of a domestic consumer focus. Um, and we think onshore Asia equities really play to that a bit more than the more tech heavy eight share market where we want to be selective from here. Um, I'm going to draw Peter in here. Another area of change that's involved with climate tends to be the commodity space, as well as precious metals. This has been a narrative for the last year. How are we seeing the, uh, the precious metal space? And then versus, say, some of the industrial metals, things like platinum. Sure. Th thanks, Norman. Um, overall, we think that, uh, you know, certainly in the coming year, uh, the precious metal space is going to illustrate a few divergences. Um, gold should be pretty much range bound somewhere between 1750 and 1850 per ounce with an upside risk towards $1,900 per ounce. Um, on gold, really, the, the, the outlook is predicated on the assumption that we do see a, a slightly more hawkish Fed. Uh, resulting in a, in a slightly higher um, or, or improved uh, U.S. real yield profile. And additionally, uh, as Patrice mentioned, as and when inflation does begin to decline, uh, we, we estimate around two thirds of the, the recent jump in inflation is due to transitory factors. That the combination of this sort of improved real rate profile and or you know, um, falling inflation should in, in turn uh, limit upside, uh, upside um, pressure on gold. So gold, broadly speaking, should be somewhat range bound. Um, for platinum, things are is definitely somewhat more nuanced. Um, interestingly, platinum was probably the best performing sort of a PGM um, a metal during the recent drawdown from sort of October, September. And um, a couple of reasons for that is that, first of all, when we look at platinum, it actually trades very cheaply compared to all of the other metals. Uh, you know, platinum gold ratio, platinum silver ratio, et cetera, it's all pretty, pretty low. Um, the second then sort of outlook on, on platinum is that a lot of the, uh, you know, sort of the, the forward curve had moved from uh, contango towards one of backwardation for a while, indicating that people were, were somewhat, I would say, uh, more cautious about the longer term outlook on platinum, reflecting the changes in the in particular in, the, in, the, in um, the construction of diesel engines. We think those concerns are somewhat overdone, uh, resulting in a, a, a pro probably still pretty stable demand outlook. And the third reason, which uh, you know we're still pretty constructive on platinum, is that what we are seeing is that uh, in the in the, in the green transition, is that uh, so-called green hydrogen will use a uh, you know a platinum as, as a key component in in in, the, uh, in its production process. So the overall demand outlook for platinum is still pretty constructive in, in our opinion. And consequently, we, we do think that it will uh, rise back to levels in around, of around $1,200 or $1,300 per ounce uh, over the course of the year. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay with you, Peter. We've got uh, uh, two more questions. Um, one, Japanese yen. We've got higher inflation around the world. Should that be positive for the Japanese economy and on the flip side, negative for the yen going forward? 
Um, that's that, that's pretty much it. Um, there are a few things happening. The first, obviously, is that the correlation between the U.S. ten-year yield and uh, and dollar yen is still very, very, uh, still very strong, and consequently, we ha we have seen dollar yen rise from levels of around 105 to current levels in around 115. Uh, that's reflecting both the improved uh, yield profile and, of course, uh, the recent appreciation of the dollar. Uh, going forward, we think that this global reflation theme and, and now inflation theme will some, somewhat weigh on the yen, uh, particularly because domestic Japanese inflation pressures are so low, and consequently there is a, there's, there's little chance of, um, sort of uh, the, the BOJ moving towards a slightly more hawkish um, pol policy stance. So as a result of the, those, uh, those factors, we do think dollar yen will, will continue to rise. Additionally, um, the, uh, the increasing oil price and energy prices will, of course, lead to a slight deterioration in, in the uh, Japanese trade balance and overall current account surplus, which may contract sli slightly over the course of the coming year. So overall, it's, it's a situation which is, as you said, pretty, uh, pretty bad news for the yen. But the flip side of that is that it's, uh, it's pretty good news for the Japanese economy, which, of course, will benefit from its um, heavy export uh, mix. And look, uh, we're getting quite a lot of good questions coming in. Again, if you do have questions, feel free to submit them via the Q&A box in your app, and I'll integrate them uh, into uh, the conversation with Peter, Patrice, uh, and Mikhail. Um, uh, so maybe coming to a point that Peter raised, I'm going to bring Patrice back into the conversation. Um, energy prices are obviously a concern, as are rising wage costs. Um, and so almost by construction, uh, uh, we, we believe as inflation uh, tapers off, we should expect energy uh, costs to taper off. Um, is that a, a reasonable expectation as we move forward? Uh, yes, we have just to be patient. That is to say, for expecting, uh, I would say, less pressure coming from the energy and the, I would say, also uh, beside the energy, we have also the constraints coming from the shortages and the bottlenecks in the industrial sector. But after the second, uh, I would say, the second effect on inflation and what is would be important to consider for next year would be the core inflation with the potential second round effects on inflation. That is to say, of course, we will enter at the end of this year and the beginning of next year with wage negotiations and notably in Germany, um, the, the new government has already proposed to raise the minimum wage uh, growth uh, significantly, and we will have the IG Metal uh, traditional negotiations. So, of course, these, um, I would say, uh, trade unions will ask, not only in Germany, but also in other countries, uh, to have some compensation against the rise in inflation and also regarding the shortages uh, in some sectors. So entering at the beginning of next year, we should have, I would say, a cyclical rise in wage growth. Um, that has to be compensated by higher productivity gains and a higher level of growth. This is why at this point of time, investment is important to compensate for these rising costs, not, a, not only coming from the energy and the supply side uh, sectors and that are expected to uh, moderate during the course of next year, but also to couple with higher level of, I would say, break-even costs uh, for the firms, uh, mainly devoted, in fact, to higher, uh, higher wage growth at the beginning of next year. So this is not something a change to structural. And once again, as you mentioned at the beginning, this is not a go back to the 70s um, because we have not this indexation process um, that now no longer is no longer in place. But of course, in, in terms of cyclical environment, we should face this higher wage um, at the beginning of next year. And after that should be compensated at the corporate level by higher investment and more productive investment. I think two things to, to highlight and extend on Patrice's comments. So yes, wages are coming up, but what we have seen is the companies that uh, have invested well in the past have allowed margins to stay fairly robust in the last reporting period. I think this is a key message that Patrice has, has put out there, this issue of investment. And this is actually an opportunity for us as investors because the things that they're going to have to invest in includes spending more time investing in things like robotics as wages start to rise. And so you're going to have a labor for capital substitution taking place. And we think that's going to be a key thematic. And when we look around the world at the penetration of robotics, 
uh, in especially industrial manufacturing lines, this is something that can grow on a compound annual basis really for the next five years, well into the double digits. So making the, these industrial companies um, really more growth companies uh, like we've seen uh, really focus on the technology space. I think the other thing to point out um, on, the, uh, on the wage side, this is also one of the reasons why core uh, in the portfolios we manage here at UBP has been what we call quality growth stories. These are companies that can absorb a bit of uh, uh, wage growth. They have pricing power. They can manage margins. And we think in this environment, these quality growth kind of narratives, especially in an environment where we think 8 to 10 percent earnings growth, are going to be important so we don't get these margin misses and this cost pressure really eating into shareholder returns. I'm, I'm going to come back to the energy side a little bit, maybe bring Peter into the picture. We've obviously seen oil prices rise fairly sharply from here. That's been a concern from people. We've seen policymakers around the world releasing strategic reserves. Um, when we look at uh, the broader industrial commodity space, this is a place where, one, it looks like you're going to have elevated prices. But to Patrice's point, I think there's a lot of reason to believe that oil prices in particular are elevated, but not too high to crimp demand, but also not so low that it hurts in effectively oil producers and prevents them from reinvesting their cash flow in green. Is that what you're looking for in terms of the energy market going forward, Peter? Um, I, I would broadly speaking, I think if we if we look at the energy, you know, particularly oil prices, for, for example, um, one of the, there there are several reasons why they're they're pretty high. Uh, the first reason, of course, is that we've seen very constrained capex in the oil market pretty much the last seven years since two thousand and fourteen, and of course that has that has uh, constricted um, you know sort of future supply. The second issue is that if we look at the OPEC Plus group, the um, the, the group is very very cohesive. And um, the, it's a, it's a sort of production curtain, curtailment policy has been very successful. So that indicates that we're, we're unlikely to see a vast increase in production by the OPEC plus group anytime soon, which should, uh, should keep um, oil prices somewhat elevated. Um, and then third, of course, I think the demand side has, of course, recovered somewhat as, uh, as economies have reopened. So if we think of oil in terms of trading ranges, where before we had sort of an effective range of between 35 and 55 dollars per barrel between 2014 and sort of 2018. Now we're in a, in a range, in, in our view at least, of between 65 to 90 dollars per barrel, with upside risks towards 100 dollars per barrel in in a sort of a stress scenario. For oil producers um, or the currencies currencies of oil producers, it's it's unambig unambiguously good news. So certainly the Russian ruble will uh, will be one of the few EM currencies to to benefit from this trend. The Norwegian krona, of course, uh, you know, will be a direct uh, ben beneficiary from higher oil prices. And indeed, the same is true of most of the other sort of uh, um, major, major oil producers. So it's, uh, it's a broadly constructive uh, outlook indeed for, for mo most oil producers. Um, the same cannot really be said for, for the producers of industrial metals, particularly the Australian dollar. Um, one of the, the things that we look at uh, when it comes to the, the Aussie dollar is, of course, the iron ore price. And uh, indeed, iron ore makes up one of the, the key components of uh, the Australian export mix. And what we've seen is that when we track Chinese credit growth and, and lag it by six months, um, that tends to correlate very, very closely with copper prices and indeed with, uh, with more industrial metals. And given that this was, was in, a, I would say, a contractionary phase over sort of most of the last year, uh, that does indicate that going forward, we're, we're still going to be in an environment of, I would say, choppy trading for, for most of the industrial metals, but particularly for the likes of uh, for iron ore. And, and maybe I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pivot back to Patrice, because I think this discussion in particular on energy, as Peter highlights, maybe on the upside 100 that creates some anxiety. Um, this really puts central banks in a challenging position in terms of policy setting um, and perhaps worth uh, outlining and highlighting some of these policy risks uh, that we see uh, looking ahead in 2022. Yes, exactly. And we have seen a lot of pressure coming from the bond market and also the citizens regarding this inflation environment. And it was also interesting to see Mr. Biden presenting the new Fed team, Ms. Powell and Mrs. Brennard, and saying that the Fed target is now to fight inflation.
So it's a, a major change in terms of monetary targets and monetary goals, because it was previously to consider to restore the growth and after to promote uh, the return to full employment for uh, for instance, for, for the Fed. So at this point of time, under the pressure coming from both citizens and bond market, uh, we have seen that government and monetary authorities are under the pressure to do something. And acting under pressure, this is the risks to to badly an answer, in fact, to the real needs uh, of these uh, environments. So. And it opens a window to the risks we mentioned, risks that are more tail risk, of course, or downside risk uh, to the growth outlook or to the economic cycle. That is to say, to tighten too much, uh, to reduce too early the liquidity. This is a debate on the tapering, on the speed of the tapering. This is a debate for the next ECB meeting in December. Uh, what about the future of the PEP, that is to say the purchases uh, of bonds coming from the ECB uh, in parallel with uh, the Fed purchases. And of course, to tighten too much interest rates, we have seen in the markets that favor the US dollar, of course, but we have seen now the money markets are betting on a three rate hikes uh, for next year from the Fed. Is it too early? Is it too much? Uh, from my personal view, I would consider it's, it's probably too rapid. And we have seen the Bank of England entering in the same debate and saying recently that they have to wait for more data. So this is a transition period after this post recovery. We enter a new period. Uh, we have to wait for the results of this new period, as we said, in terms of investment. And we have to live with the high inflation. So the pressure coming for the market or the citizens who, who could uh, generate, I would say, this kind of policy errors or policy mistake. And the risk is to, uh, um, to have an abrupt end of this economic cycle or to tighten too much the budgetary policy to go back to the previous uh, restrictive uh, budgetary policy we had at the traditional exit of the past crisis. So at this point of time, I would say that a more fine tuning coming from the economic policy and monetary authorities is more needed and even more needed than at the end and the traditional rebound of the past crisis. But this has opened the window to tail risk and these tail risks could be important entering at the beginning of next year and to reduce or to moderate further in the second part of next year. And indeed, I think these tail risks are something that are very much on our mind, especially over the course of the last uh, few months. Uh, one of the questions we have coming in really speak to this in regards to valuations in the equity markets um, and especially as the Fed looks to withdraw their stimulus. Um, and yes, we are concerned about valuations in the equity markets, but to be honest, where we're more concerned has been what has been very, very tight spreads in the credit markets. And when you look at U.S. equities in particular, but we can look at global equities as well, U.S. equities actually still are very cheap against credit and can absorb as much as, let's call it about a 50 basis point rise in uh, tenure treasuries and a modest widening in spreads. But if you have a situation like we saw, for example, in 2014, 2015, as the Fed was withdrawing their support and spreads start moving out more meaningfully, then the headwinds to sustaining these kinds of multiples in US equities start to become a challenge. And I think this is one of the reasons that what you've seen on our part over the course of the last few months is really pivoting portfolios from directional to more what we call asymmetric. We wanna participate if our base case plays out and we get the economic recovery, eight to 10% type of returns in equity. But we also want to more increasingly incorporate some protection in portfolios, as Mikhail has highlighted, which we did in early 2020 to help weather the early days of the pandemic. And so maybe I'll, I'll bring Mikhail into uh, this discussion um, and really talk about um, how we use uh, uh, asymmetric strategies to cushion this kind of uncertainty uh, in a year like we expect in 2022. Thanks, Norman, for the question. Um, overall, the, the previous uh, methodology applied by a lot of portfolio managers was to diversify a lot of portfolios and to have a global uh, 
allocation on the different segments of the markets, different regions, and to expect to have a certain compensation between the winner and the, and the, and the losers, and at the end of the day to have a certain level of performances. What we decide to do from 2016, 2017, considering the shift and the transition you mentioned uh, we have on the, on the overall economies, the decision we took was to, uh, to change the approach and to have uh, a focus on certain areas. Uh, mainly US, we have to say on the quality growth area, but also in certain part of the portfolios on Europe, less investment in Asia and Japan, and to have a focus on that, to expect, of course, from our analysis uh, to have excess return. And thanks to that, to be able to finance what we call convexity, meaning shock absorbers in the portfolios, and to have uh, a portfolio construction uh, in, in, uh, in consistency with the uh, environment. And this approach, I mean, to have on one hand a huge conviction to be invested in certain areas in the market, and on the other side to have some compensation coming from deriv derivative instruments or shock absorber, we can, we can say that. It, was, it is for us a, a good compromise to manage uh, the risk currently. And also to be sure that we have investment focus on the right areas. The good news is that this area, meaning uh, quality growth, as we named, is this area is complete, completely compatible with the next step we're expecting from the sustainable investment. And we have a, a complete consistency between this positioning and what we could expect from uh, the sustainable investment. And, and so in a sense, by proactively uh, creating this asymmetry within portfolios, it allows us on our longer term investments to stay focus on some of these higher conviction themes that we expect to play out over the next three to five years rather than tactically moving in and out. Is that, is that right, Mikhail? Yeah, correct. Very complicated to have tactical trades. It, it's quite dangerous uh, because we have seen with this massively injection of liquidity, of course, the valuation are key in terms of analysis and, and, and risk, but overall, if we have earnings in place, if we have uh, the right delivery of what we're expecting from the companies, we can continue to be invested and to avoid to be in and out uh, with a permanent point of view, which is quite com complicated to manage uh, on this specific uh, period. And let's stay on the risk front a little bit, maybe if I bring Peter into the conversation once again. Um, we haven't talked very much about emerging markets, and I think as you've referred, uh, one of the headwinds that we see on the emerging markets fronts uh, is uh, the trajectory for China. Um, typically, when we see the Fed tightening, the dollar strengthening, emerging markets sometimes run into some meaningful problems. Is this something that we should worry about in 2022? Um, I, th I think really what, what we tend to find, we tend to find two things when the Fed raises rates. So what happens is either we see EM currency weakness, very, very broad based, or we see EM um, central banks raising rates pretty quickly. Um, what we've seen this time around is that one or two um, EM central banks have raised their interest rate profiles quite aggressively. And this is notably the case in Russia, then to a lesser extent in Brazil. Uh, but then we've got uh, quite a few other laggards, um, particularly the likes of Mexico, South Africa, et cetera, where they haven't really raised their interest rate profiles in, in any sort of meaningful manner. However, these, um, these, these currencies are less vulnerable than was the case in 2013 during the tapered tantrum because their current accounts are in much better shape. So at the time, you'll remember that we have the so-called fragile five, which are basically very large emer emerging market uh, countries, all of whom illustrated very large current account deficits. These deficits are much smaller than they were before, meaning that if we do see a big increase in the cost of external funding, um, their, uh, you know, their current accounts won't be in, in, in such bad shape. Uh, and consequently, we shouldn't see too much uh, currency weakness from that channel at least. However, the, the, when you throw in sort of a, a slowing China into the mix, um, you know, that's definitely bad news for many EMs, uh, mainly speaking because China is now their, their, their largest market. So in a sense, really, we, I kind of think that many of the high beta EMs, the likes of Mexico, South Africa, uh, Brazil, uh, et cetera, all of these, uh, these currencies are kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, on the one hand, we, we, you, you've got the Fed raising rates, which it was typically bad news for EM currencies. And then on the other, we've got, uh, with, uh, we've got a slowing China. So really, the, the EM currencies that will tend to do well over the coming year 
are those currencies where we've already seen proactive uh, and aggressive central bank um, uh, rate hikes with the prospect of more to come. And certainly uh, Russia and, and then to a lesser extent Brazil uh, are, are the, uh, the, the main winners in that regard there. Um, and that's kind of really how it looks. Of course, th there are one or two idiosyncratic stories. Turkey is the, the obvious outlier where the central bank has actually engaged in a rate cutting cycle. And you've seen the lira has, has, has really been, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, decimated pretty much since September with a depreciation in the region of around 40% in the space of two or three months. So it's, it's a tricky time for EM. Um, and in a nutshell, where we see, um, you know, an aggressive policy, proactive policy response function, the currencies will do just fine. Uh, where we see a lagging policy response function, the currencies will weaken. We want to be selective in EM. Um, but at the same time, and I think an important message, we don't see, you know, the historical systemic reverberations where a problem in one necessarily flows into the asset class as a whole. Is that fair characterization? I think it's a fair characterization. And I think that the role of benchmarks in this regard is also very important, um, because certainly where we have seen these idiosyncratic stories, Turkey being an obvious example, it now has a very, very low weighting in the ben benchmarks, and even benchmark following funds will, will probably have pretty low exposures there. So the spillover effect won't be as, as significant. Um, I think the w one aspect which we're, we're still pretty constructive on an EM is the Chinese renminbi, uh, the one uh, which, we, which we anticipate will continue to modestly appreciate over the course of the year. And um, that reflects China's enormous trade surplus. It's now got uh, a record trade surplus uh, in at around $700 billion, um, which of course is enormous. And, and indeed, that's a very, very strong source of underlying demand for, for the yuan, which we think will we'll continue to appreciate. Um, the Chinese authorities have continued to favor having a, a, a stable uh, or indeed mo modest appreciation bias for, for the yuan. Um, and indeed, as sort of uh, China undertakes its, its reform agenda, having this uh, very, very stable currency uh, provides a, a real anchor of stability uh, to enable everything else to happen. And, and clearly a stable currency, modest strengthening currency helps it deal with its producer price inflation problem to a certain extent as well. It does, yeah. They, they export to inflation in, in a sense. Um, but, but as well, I think uh, what it does, having that stable currency, is a, is a really big benefit for China in an era of, of increasing commodity prices. Okay, look, I see we're, we're approaching the top of the hour, and we've covered a number of different topics, and I want to thank uh, uh, our panelists uh, for, uh, for joining me. Um, but if I can uh, just summarize some of the key messages, hopefully, that have been taken away uh, from today's discussion and that you can f find in more detail in our brochure, and I'll share with you the link to uh, that brochure uh, shortly. On the economic front, even though there is a lot of discussion about inflation and it is going to be elevated, as Patrice points out, for much of 2022, this narrative of the 1970s, we think, is probably not the right narrative to be focused on, but instead looking at something more like the 1950s, early 60s, higher growth, elevated inflation, and not coincidentally, this was a period of transformation as well, uh, coming out of World War II for the United States, uh, as well as Europe. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about uh, today, but certainly another risk on the horizon, is this issue of uh, geopolitical risk. Just as Trump in his second year pivoted towards foreign policy, that's something that we look for the Biden administration to do, and that can create um, some new tensions. But we don't think there's going to be outright hostilities between the two, but instead presents the prospect uh, that somebody steps over the line and like during the trade war, you have threats to growth going forward. Um, I think the climate story remains an important narrative for us, not only because of things like COP26, but most importantly, as Patrice has highlighted, it's the narrative of this is where the next level of investment needs to take place to help drive productivity growth uh, in the next cycle. And so watching that play out and, and, and having governments move in that direction is going to be very key uh, to moving forward in this more 1950s style uh, recovery. On the equities front, again, 8 to 10% kind of returns for 2022, uh, not as good as, roughly speaking, the 15 to 20 we saw in the last two years, but still respectable. But you're going to have to pick stocks, we think, in 2022, 
as has been the case increasingly in 2021. And where we're focusing on are high quality earnings. These are the companies that can pass along costs and absorb some costs and use efficiency gains uh, to mitigate any types of pressures they see. And then we pair that with these transformational opportunities we see in the global economy, the global uh, energy transition, the shifting and refocus towards China's domestic economy, this move of global industrials to leveraging technology. And then as we've talked about a new era in the EU, leveraging fiscal policy to drive its own transformation going forward. On the fixed income side, again, this is going to be a year where we want to continue to actively manage risk going forward. We think treasury yields and bonds continue to move to levels that we haven't seen in a couple of years from here. And so investors are going to have to really move to replace traditional fixed income coupons with more non-traditional strategies. We think long short credit, uh, long credit vol types of strategies are interesting in the hedge fund space looking at illiquidity premiums in the private market space, or even structured product opportunities to capitalize as vol looks to pick up. And as Peter points out, having been bearish the dollar for multiple years, we've now pivoted and investors should look for a strong dollar, in particular against the euro going forward, and then pick spots and things like gold and silver, maybe some trading opportunities there. Uh, while we do have some uh, climate-oriented tailwinds for things like platinum. Um, as I said, um, that's a brief summary of what you can find uh, on the following slide in our actual brochure um, called Embracing Change. You can find that on the internet where we delve into these nine themes uh, that are shaping our investment focus for 2022 into much more detail. Um, so please uh, go onto the internet, uh, take a look at that. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to your relationship manager or anybody on the investment team, and we're happy to engage you uh, on that uh, as well. And so with that, I want to thank Peter, I want to thank Patrice, and thank Mikhail uh, for joining us today. And I want to thank all of you uh, for taking the time to allow us to share our thoughts on what the investment outlook looks like for 2022.